Thanks for joining us again as we study through the Bible with Brenda Lane at Glenville Church. We welcome you to join us on Sunday mornings or Wednesday evenings with the fall semester approaching. May you continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. I'm very excited about uh, today's lesson. We are going to be uh, studying today about prayer and spiritual conflict. We're going to be studying from the book of Daniel, and so right away you think that we're going to be looking at him when he was in the lion's den, but we're not. We're going to be studying chapter 10 of Daniel. He's already experienced the lion's den. That's all in the past. I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, oh, I believe that, uh, I don't remember if it was 95 or 98, but Daniel was in his 90s. He wasn't a young boy when uh, he was thrown into the lion's den. So, but anyway, what we're studying today uh, takes place uh, after that. And, uh, and what I want us to look at mainly today is what happens in the spiritual realm when Christians pray. When we pray, exactly what happens in the spiritual realm when we pray? And I believe that Daniel chapter 10 tells us more, as far as I know anyway, more plainly than any other place in the Bible, what happens when Christians pray. So if we will begin uh, reading in chapter 10, verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, that would have been 536 B.C., Daniel, also known as Belshazzar, had another vision. It concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship, and Daniel understood stood what the vision meant. That was probably a very, and um, we'll see in a little bit, that it was a very sad time for David to ha or for Daniel to have a vision like that because the uh, captivity is over. Jews are moving back to Jerusalem. They're rebuilding it. Uh, I don't know why Daniel wasn't back there. I know God had a purpose. It may have been his age. It could have been uh, a lot of things. But anyway, he's... He isn't there, but it is going on. But the captivity is over. So it looks like a time of maybe peace and rebuilding and, and the future looks bright. They're going to go back and re, they rebuilt the wall and they're going to rebuild Jerusalem and, and, and the temple. And they're going to, because it had been all been destroyed. So it looks like a very good time. A good time for uh, the nation of Israel. So just as this on the brink of it, seemingly a time when their hearts could be at ease and at peace, Daniel has a vision. And that vision uh, takes place, it starts here in chapter 10, and it goes to the end of the book, which is through chapter 12. All of that is a vision of things yet to come. And folks, most of those things in this vision from chapter 10 through chapter 12 are yet to come. Daniel is a great book of prophecy. God gave Daniel a lot of information, and as he did Isaiah and, men, and, and the other prophets, he gave him information of what was going to happen in the end, and a time beyond our time. So we read it, and Daniel and Revelation track right together. So if you ever study the book of uh, Daniel, it'd be well to study the book of Revelation with it or vice versa because they track right together. How awesome is that, folks? That God would be telling Daniel way back then in 536 BC about the end times and in that vision he said it concerned events certain to happen in the future so it's not over yet all the pain and and, and uh, hard times that they've been through being captives 
it's not over yet. And he said, it'll happen in the future. It will be times of war and great hardship. And if you uh, study the rest of this book, uh, or you study the book of Revelation, you find out how uh, bad things get uh, during the tribulation in, in Israel. So he had... He has, uh, when Israel's captivity was over, they were returning home. The hard times were not over. So verse 2 says, When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three weeks. So in mourning, verse 3 explains that. He said, all that time for three weeks... He said, I had eaten no rich food or meat, had drunk no wine, and had used no fragrant oils. Fragrant oils are making a comeback, aren't they? In the health field. So anyway, uh, but he said, I didn't do any of that. I was in mourning, deeply saddened by the vision that he saw. So he said uh, in verse 4, on April 23rd, as I was standing beside the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a dazzling gem. From his face came flashes of lightning, and his eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice was like the roaring of a vast multitude of people. Okay, who is this person that looks like a man? Who is it? I think we have two choices. Gabriel has been used before to come and explain visions. Gabriel, uh, the angel, has been, has been sent to uh, Daniel before to explain visions. If you'll look back at... Uh, Chapter 8, verse 16. It says, And I, Daniel, was trying to understand the meaning of this verse. Someone who looked like a man suddenly stood in front of me. I heard a human voice calling out from the Uli River, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of his vision. So, some similarities there. Okay, now if you turn over to Revelation chapter 1. Verses uh, 13 through 15. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was the Son of Man, Jesus. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were bright like flames of fire. His feet were as bright as bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like, a, like mighty ocean waves. So there's some similarities there. So who is this person that is speaking... Uh, to Daniel. Is it Gabriel, the angel, or is it Jesus Christ? He made, Jesus made, several, we've studied several of them. He made several appearances in the Old Testament. Is this one of them? As we study on through this chapter, I drew a conclusion on who I think it is, and as we study on through this chapter, I want to see if you draw the same conclusion that I did. Verse number seven, he said, I, Daniel, am the only one who saw this vision. He said, the men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So I don't know if they saw the bright light. Something scared them. So they ran away. So Daniel was all alone. Verse number eight says, so number one, I was left there all alone to watch this amazing vision. Number two, my strength left me. Number three, my face grew deathly pale. Number four, and I felt very weak. 
when I heard him speak, number five, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. That was quite an experience. I mean, he was got so terrified that it, it literally made him feel ill and he fainted. You know, there was a book in the 70s or 80s and uh, which was just a piece of trash, but a lot of Christians were reading it. And they told examples of people that special times that Jesus had talked to them. And uh, one man, he was, said he was, his experience was he was shaving one morning and Jesus appeared there in his bathroom and told him such and such was going to happen. And, and uh, so then when Jesus finished telling him what was going to happen, he just continued shaving until he finished. And one person was watching Laverne and Shirley and the, Jesus appeared to them. And so he told them something that was going to happen. And when he was finished and left, they continued to watch Laverne and Shirley. Really? Really? This is the experience you have. If Jesus appeared to us in any place, my friend, we'd stop what we were doing. And, and we'd probably have a, relax, a reaction somewhat, if not identical, to what Daniel had. This was the human, godly response of a man that loved and feared and respected the Lord. He didn't just keep doing what he was doing. He got so terrified, he fainted. Number 10, verse 10. Just then, a hand touched me and lifted me up, still trembling to my hands and knees. Not even able to get completely in an upright position yet, but he lifted him up where he made it to his hands and knees. And the man said to me, O oh, Daniel, greatly loved of God. Is that not the sweetest thing you've ever heard? O oh, Daniel, greatly loved of God. And you know what? He would say that to you today. Put your name in there. I'll put mine. O oh, Brenda, greatly loved of God. Did you put your name in there? Greatly loved of God. He said, listen carefully. Uh, and another thing about Daniel, I mentioned this right here. Uh, the Bible doesn't record any of Daniel's sins. Now, did he sin? Yes. We know he was a sinner, just like everybody else. But on the things that really mattered, none of his sins are recorded. Uh, there are several like that. Another one is uh, Joseph. None of his sins are recorded. They always appear to do the right thing. They're men of prayer. They're men that love God and follow God. But folks, let me tell you something. They did not have easy lives. Because they lived for Jesus and pr or lived for God and, and prayed to him and trusted him, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery Potiphar's wife told a lie about him that landed him in the pokey, and he was there for many years. It, it wasn't easy. Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. It wasn't easy. I think Christians think that when something hard comes into our life, well, I did something to deserve this. No, a lot of the pain that you go through, the hardships that you have and that I have, are part of God's plan. Sometimes God's plan includes pain. And a lot of times Christians don't understand that. They'll say, I don't know how God could do this. I don't know how God could allow this. Folks, think about Daniel. Think about Joseph, great men and greatly loved of God. Their life was not easy. And is, look at the disciples. All of them except one, um, history teaches us, was martyred. They died 
for what they believe, except for John. Well, he didn't have it too easy either. He was dipped in oil and left on the Isle of Patmos where he received the revelation. Their lives weren't easy, and they didn't end easily. The disciples didn't. They ended being martyred because of what they believed. So, folks, because we're Christians does not mean everything's going to be just right. It doesn't mean life's going to be easy. It doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. It means that we have a God who hears us when we pray and that he's always with us. He said in Psalm 46, 1, I'm a very present help in trouble. So if you're in trouble, God says, I'm there. You may not feel me. You may not see me working. But I want to tell you right here in this psalm, when you're in trouble, I'm there. He said, I, Jesus told us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have friends that leave you. You have friends that forsake you. Jesus said, I won't. So we have a friend that will go with us. But folks... God uses pain sometimes. So we need to just, when we go through those times of pain, we just need to trust God because he knows what he's doing in our life. And, and just trust him and pray to him. But verse 11 says, And the man said to me, O Daniel, greatly loved of God, listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up. He's on his hands and knees. That's as far as he's made it so far. He said, stand up. For I have been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up still trembling with fear. Verse number 12. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. I'll give you an excellent Bible study get a concordance and just go through the Bible. You don't have to do any study of it. Just go through the Bible and read every fear not and don't be afraid in the Bible. Just get like a Strong's concordance. Read every time in the Bible it says fear not. Read every time in the Bible where it says don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. My friends, I'll tell you what. It'll take the fear right out of you. Because you'll see how many times, over and over and over, God has instructed us, don't be afraid, don't fear, fear not. He has instructed us over and over, don't let the things of the world make you afraid. I'm your God. I'm your Father. I'm in charge. I have everything under control. Our nation is not out of God's control. He is very much in control of everything that's going on. We can trust God when we don't maybe don't feel like we can trust Washington. But folks, our God is in charge. His will will be done. I, I think we have a responsibility to vote. And I have a saying, if you don't vote, don't gripe. You didn't earn the right. Now, that means that if I do vote, I can gripe. So, no. <laughs> but I think we have to be our, do our part in the voting booth, whatever that is. But, folks, we need to do our part in prayer. We do. It will make a difference. I want you to listen to these verses. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you begin to pray, and here we find out what he was praying for. He said, it didn't tell us earlier, but it tells us here. Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you begin to pray for understanding. He prayed when he had that vision, God help me to understand the vision that you're giving me and to humble yourselves before your God. Your request has been heard in heaven. Okay, look at uh, verse number two. 
Daniel said, I had been in mourning for how long? Three weeks. And in verse um, 13, but for 21 days, the spirit of the prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. How long is three weeks? 21 days. Same amount of time. He said, your prayer was heard. He had been praying for three weeks. He said, your prayer was heard. And he had been sent. Whom this, if this is uh, Gabriel or if this is Jesus. He said, I had been sent to explain it to you. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. You know, God, the angels have a uh, order. And I believe that there are angels put over certain nations. And I, God's angels. And I think the United States. I think we have an angel. His job is to, is the United States. And I believe that every uh, nation has an angel. I believe every person has a guardian angel. There's an order to what they do. But he said, I was given the message to come and explain to you. Now, God, so that means God sent him, right? I was given the, the answer to your prayer, and I was sent to deliver that message to you. But Satan has mimicked God's order with his demons and so for every ungodly nation there is also an ungodly demon and maybe even for what we might term as godly nations there's probably a good and an evil for each one but he said but so he's on his way he's been sent by God and he's on his way to answer uh, Daniel's prayer and to give him the information that he want or that he requested. He said, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven and I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, so the demon the demonic uh, adversary of Persia blocked my way. Just think about that a minute. Don't know how he did it. Don't know what he did. There was a warfare going on, a battle that they were fighting. And he said... Um, But the 21 day, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. You prayed three weeks ago. I was sent three weeks ago, but I got delayed three weeks by a demonic adversary. He said, then Michael, the archangel, came to help me. And I left him there. With he, he left Michael, or uh, yes, he left Michael. He said, I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia, the demonic adversary. He said, now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. The message that God sent him with, he has finally arrived. Why has it taken three weeks? He was in a spiritual battle. His way was blocked. He had to fight his way through to deliver the message that God had given him to give to Daniel. Verse 14 says, Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. So Michael made his passage possible because Michael... The archangel showed up to help him. He made his passage possible. 
So now let me ask you, have you come to the same conclusion that I did? Is this Jesus or is this Gabriel? It's Gabriel, isn't it? Jesus wouldn't have needed Michael's help or anybody else's. And all the demons in hell could not have stopped Jesus, could not have hindered him, could not have interfered with what he meant to do. So I don't think there's any doubt about it. This is Gabriel. I read several commentaries that thought it was Jesus, but when I studied on down through the chapter, I thought, doesn't sound like my Jesus to me. But it does sound like spiritual warfare. And we use that phrase rather lightly. I mean, I have. I think, well, this is spiritual warfare. But folks, I don't stop to think about spiritual warfare. It is really going on by created beings, angels that God created. And a third of them decided to follow Lucifer, and they are fallen angels. They are demons, but there's a lot of them. And then two-thirds of them uh, were, true, were true to God, and they battle in the unseen realm. They do battle with each other. And good receives their power from the prayers of God's people. Why was he coming in the first place? Because Daniel prayed. Why was that spiritual war going on, that, that fight, a literal, a literal battle going on between demons, the fallen angels, and God's holy angels, actually warring and fighting? What? Daniel prayed. That's what caused it. Folks, listen, we need to pray. God answers prayer. Could Daniel have been concerned that I prayed that three weeks ago and I haven't heard anything yet? You know, how long have you been praying for something? What battle is going on to keep that from coming to pass? What battle are the angels fighting? With, with the demons. There is a warfare going on in the realm that we cannot see, but it's as literal as any war that takes place on the, United, on the uh, earth. It's as real, it's as literal as any battle that is fought on earth or, or anywhere else. It's a real warfare that is going on God's holy angels are protecting you. But do you know when they give you the most protection? When you ask for it. You know, our nation right now, I would admonish all of you, pray for the United States of America. It's where we live. It's our home. It's as much our home as Jerusalem was Daniel's home. And he prayed. And do you see what happened because he prayed? One man prayed. You say, well, there's not enough Christians in the United States praying. Well, I don't think there probably is either, but it doesn't take everybody. It'd be better if it was everybody, because that'd be a great turning back to God, and we'd be pretty good shape then. If, if Christians would trust God and turn to him, this nation could revive. But folks, everybody doesn't seem to be of a mind to pray, but are you? You're the only one you can do anything about. I'm the only, you know, I can ask you to pray, and I can say we need to pray. I can say God acts on our prayers. Satan tries to stop it, but God acts on it, and there's that battle going on. But one person's prayer makes a difference. That's where we've got to get away from the fact that, well, there aren't enough people praying. Well, you know, okay. But are you? Am I? Are we on our knees or, or looking into the heavens and saying, God help America, mainly that we would turn back to you? We're not just asking for deliverance for the American dream. We're asking for our nation. Help 
our nation. We're in a place I never thought we would be. We are divided. We are imploding. We're being destroyed from the inside. Bring us together. Folks, Daniel was the one that prayed. And you see what it meant to his nation. Did it mean that there were only good times ahead? No. Israel has, <laughs> they've been in trouble since forever. And it's not going to quit until Jesus comes back. So it doesn't mean everything's a bed of roses. It just means that God's will is being done. Pray for God's will. And it's God's will that all would come to repentance. Let's not forget that. But see, folks, sometimes we think, well, my prayer is not going to make any difference. My prayer is not going to change anything. Well, I'm glad Daniel didn't feel that way. He changed history because he prayed. So we need to be people of prayer. Verse 15, while he was speaking to me, I looked down at the ground, unable to say a word. He's still pretty weak. Verse 16, then the one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing in front of me, I am terrified by the vision I have seen, my Lord, and I am very weak. How can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone. I can hardly breathe. He was overwhelmed. He was gasping for breath. Verse 18, then the one who looked like a man touched me again, and I felt my strength returning. Don't be afraid, he said. For you are deeply loved by God. Be at peace, take heart, and be strong. So, read those verses this afternoon personally to you. As if it was saying to you. Just to you. Not to Daniel, not to somebody else, but to you. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are deeply loved by God. Be at peace. You want to live a peaceful life? God tells us how. Just to trust him, not to be afraid. Be at peace. Take heart and be strong. It's good stuff, isn't it? As he spoke these words, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, Now you may speak, my Lord, for you have strengthened me. He said, Okay, I can hear it now. You've strengthened me until I'm ready to hear it, and I can hear it. Verse 20, he replied, Do you know why I have come? Soon I must... Re now listen to this. A literal angel... I believe, said these words. Do you know why I've come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. He's going back to the battle. This angel is, who we believe is probably Gabriel. He said, soon I must, re must return to fight against the spirit prince of the king of Persia. And then against the spirit prince of the king of Greece, which was to come. You'll find out about it if you read on in chapter 11. But before I do that, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. There is no one to help me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. So evidently, Michael is the angel that is over Israel. That's what I drew from it. I have been standing beside Michael as his support and defense, listen to this, since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Do you see it? He is an angel. He had an assigned duty at an assigned time. 
It's not some blurry thing that, that we can't understand. He said, I stand by, my, uh, by Michael, Michael stands by me, and I have been his support and defense since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. He had an assigned duty marked for a assigned time. They're real, folks. The angel realm is very real, literal. When you pray, God sends the answers many times through the angels. They have messages to deliver. We saw today they can be hindered in that. So take heart. If your prayer hasn't been answered, don't give up. You don't know what battle is being fought to see that your prayer is answered. I love this chapter. It gives me a whole new insight on spiritual warfare, that it is a literal battle going on by angels, and they're fighting for you. And you know when they fight for you? When you pray. I hope this makes prayer more important to you. I hope it gives you more confidence in your prayer. I hope it strengthens you in your prayer life because prayer changes things. Folks, we need an active prayer life about so many things. And so many of us limit our prayers to our families. I pray for my family every day, more than once a day, and I'll continue to do that. I figure if I'm not gonna pray for them, who is? If their mother and grandmother is not going to pray for them, if their dad and grandpa aren't going to pray for them, who is? I'm grateful that some of you do, but we have a responsibility to pray for our family, and we pray for them every day. But folks, we need to get outside of our family. We have a big God, and we need to pray for many things. We need to pray for many people, whether we know them or not. We need to pray for uh, our, our nation. And so we need to realize that God hears and answers prayer. And it's our prayers sometimes that sets these series of events into motion. It was Daniel's prayer that set that series of events into motion. Gabriel wouldn't have, ha if Daniel hadn't prayed, Gabriel wouldn't have had the message. He wouldn't, have been, he wouldn't have been delayed or run into the conflict. None of that would have happened. He made it, didn't he? Because Daniel prayed. So, folks, prayer is so important, and it's powerful. It's so powerful. I don't think any one of us in this room have have touched the tip of the iceberg on how powerful prayer is. I hope you'll enjoy it more. I hope your prayer life becomes exciting and, and full of enthusiasm and trust and love for the Lord so that when you pray, you know he's heard you and, and the answer is on the way, whatever it is. It's God's will. I prayed about it. Now I trust him with it. Whatever happens, I know he's in charge of, and I have an angel watching over me that has kept me from so many things, has kept me caught by a train so I wouldn't have an accident on the other side of it. Who knows how our angels work, but they protect us in many, many ways. They're empowered by our prayer. Do you just see a little glimpse of what that means? That opens up all kinds of power to you as a believer. I'll tell you what, that excites me a lot. Pray, trust God, pray like Daniel did, and know that God, God hears your prayers. There's no doubt about that. God answers your prayers. I don't believe we pray a single prayer that God does not answer. Boy, we're going to have to go. I'm kind of excited about this, but we're running a little late. We're going to dispense with our song. And, uh, and I'm sorry that I kept you a little late. I got too excited about it. That's all right. God bless you.